My name is Jacques Lucasse and I'm from the Netherlands. started when uh, motorcycle uh, vacations were not long enough. Uh, I think most of the people have, have a feeling like that, they, they never want to go home. I had the same and I thought, well, why, why going home? And um, I always wanted to visit Australia, so that's what I did. When I got the Fireblade in 92, I took the crate as well uh, at the shop and in 92 I sent it to Australia. Uh, rode around for 38,000 kilometers, shipped it back, went back as a backpacker to Indonesia. Indonesia, I liked, I loved it, but I missed my wheels. And at that time, I got a feeling that I can do longer trips. So in '95, I started off with the same fire blade uh, to, for a trip to the other end of the world and back. It took about 160,000 uh, kilometers, so 100,000 miles and it lasted till 98 and that's it. that are the major trips uh, the main trips before the r1 world travel which you referred to before the question everybody asked me why an r1 i hear that all the time and for me it's very simple it's uh, a bike of my heart and i find that for me more important than the right bike for the terrain somebody else do doesn't uh, matter what bike uh, he wants to take or she take an all-road bike because it's better for the terrain but if you want a specific bike take it take the bike of your heart because if your heart is in it you achieve virtually anything when I started to travel uh, in the early 90s I did some research there wasn't the internet at those stage and I heard from people that all the time the, the, the gear rack was breaking so I thought, why, breaking, uh, why building a gear rack? Why not mounting boxes directly on the, on the subframe? So that's why I designed this system and, and it seems to work. And the weight is really in, in to, uh, towards the front and narrow uh, to the bike. So the weight distribution of, of the Fireblade and the R1 is, is actually very good. Even if the box is filled, I can still put my knee down. That's actually another reason that I ride uh, R1s and, uh, and Fireblade. Um, so, although my bikes look heavily modified, except the boxes, they are not. They still have the, 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 the I don't know the word, from, from, from a crotch rocket. They still, <laughs> you can do everything with it, what, what other, other people can do with it. So, uh, of course you're limited in, in a little way, but you can still have fun, believe me. And I, I do have fun every now and then on them. To the, before I started my R1 trip, I already had in mind to go to the North Pole. And I thought by myself, I must do one other big trip before I go to the North Pole and then I, I start writing, I want to sh share my stories with the people and then sponsors will, will be available to finance the trip to the North Pole. So actually I had the North Pole already in mind before I went with the uh, R1 around the world. Now, uh, it's incredibly important to have uh, a lot of knowledge about the terrain. So that's why I started to do winter rides. I went to the North uh, Cape during winter. I went to the most northern point from Alaska that you can reach on public road that is a dead horse in 2009. And in 2013, I went on the polar ice uh, on a trip from uh, Point Barrow down to Key West. But for me, the most important po uh, part of it was the ride on the polar ice. For that, I took another R1. I call it the polar ice ride R1. Uh, why again an R1? Uh, the answer is actually very, very simple. Not for cornering, because there's no cornering on the ice. But I know this bike inside out. I trust it. It uh, has an incredible re reliability. And if you, something breaks down and you have to repair it, you want a bike that you know inside out. So that's why I took an R1. And it doesn't matter what bike you take, because even if you take a, a Beamer or, or whatever bike, you have to uh, um, heavily uh, modify it to be able to ride on the polar ice. 
So I took, put massive wheels on uh, this bike, uh, but they're not wide enough. Uh, but like uh, like we said, it, it is a test, and I found that I had hoped that with little modifications I could uh, prepare the same bike to go to the North Pole. It turned out to be different. Uh, I made it over the polar ice, so I succeeded in that, but I wasn't able to pull the sledge, uh, at least not the whole way. So it turned out that I cannot uh, take my own fuel with me. But I also cannot do the filming, and if I can't do filming and photography, it's, it, it's not good. So on my next trip, I'm going to build another bike. Uh, I'm going to use a Donor R1 uh, uh, as a base. And it's going to have massive tires. It's going to have tires about 60 centimeters wide on the back, 40 centimeters on the front. So it's going to be, but it's going to be beautiful looking, I tell you. Uh, I, I'm still going to pull a sledge, uh, but there will only be my normal things on it, which I need for daily use. Uh, they are not allowed, uh, because there is a backup vehicle or a backup dog sled or whatever, to, to do the filming and to carry the fuel. But I will do all the work myself, so I will ride all the way myself to the North Pole. Uh, I'm not, I don't know if I'm the first uh, to ride to the North Pole. I heard from a Japanese guy. Uh, I haven't seen real pictures. Uh, it, it might be true, it might not be. Um, but that's not, that's not my, um, my goal to be a first. It's just my goal is to go to the North Pole. And I don't know, I don't care if I'm first, second or third, as long as I get there. The, the plan is only to go towards the North Pole. I know that the Russians have during, uh, from the end of spring and during summer, they have a base there. So they should be able to fly, fly everything out, which is expensive, but the whole trip will be enormously uh, expensive anyway. Uh, but the plan uh, is not to ride back, no. Our plan is to fly out. I only want to go towards the North Pole. Once you start uh, riding in the morning on the, on the polar ice or in very uh, cold climate, you, uh, you get dressed in the morning and that's it. So you've got to get dressed actually for the whole day. You don't open your jacket during the day and put another vest on. So it's very important that you have all the layers on that you need. Uh, I have many layers because I, I don't gamble on one horse, but I also have electric heated clothing. And the good thing from electric heated clothing is that you can cover uh, temperature uh, fluctuations or differences. Don't know the word. I'm Dutch. So. <laughs> uh, but the, the good thing is that you, you can cover that. If you have to work really hard and the temperature is only minus 15, uh, you don't need electric heated clothing, so you shut it off. If you're riding... Uh, 30 kilometers an hour on reasonable good ice conditions and there's a strong wind and you don't have to work hard, you put them on and it's minus 30, you put them on. So th that's a good thing about electric heating clothing. Uh, I used, uh, before I used electric heating clothing from Klan and uh, mainly look well uh, suit and a look well overall uh, to keep warm. Uh, the the trips, uh, during the trips that I did before, I found out many things about the bike and uh, I thought about how to deal with it. And then you look how, how people deal with it in Alaska, how people deal with it in Norway, uh, how they deal with it with cars and do the same thing on the bike. Uh, what the battery goes on, uh, uh, at minus 40, a battery doesn't do anything. At minus 25, a battery actually is already dead. So I used a Hawker battery, an Odyssey battery, which has a minus 40. It has still 50% uh, of a starting capacity, which is more than an original standard R1 battery. So that's how I, uh, I dealt with that problem. The other problem is the starting. Uh, I had, uh, I preheated the carburetors. I have a generator with me with two, 220 volt. I have a, a a wire around the carburetors, which becomes warm when I put it in the 220. 
around uh, that's winded around the carburetors. Around that is uh, aluminium tape, so all the heat is forced into the carburetors, and that's that's brilliant. That works really good. So that's how I preheat the carburetors. The engine I preheat uh, the same like they do in uh, Norway. I have a, a little uh, heater uh, in the cooling system. I connect it to the 220 again and warm uh, cooling liquid starts to rise and that's how the cooling circuit starts to uh, it starts to circulate, circulate and that's how I, I preheat my engine till about zero degrees and then I start it. And then I have special oil in there from uh, Putoline and the oil is specially designed for me. It can go to uh, the poor point of that oil is minus 51 Celsius. So normal oil again so like minus 25 it starts to get solid but this oil becomes uh, stays liquid till minus 51 degrees so the modifications that uh, you do to your bike is uh, you always have to be aware what 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 uh, what it does with the bike now a wire around the carburetors doesn't do much uh, that was my first thinking, but you never know what happens because if you pack, uh, pack in a, a carburetor, you never know. So that's why where the tests were for. Uh, I had some problems where, when I did the Alaska ride with the preheating of the, of the engine. And I know now what was wrong and I'm going to change that. I also found out a, a problem with the oil filter. Uh, oil filter uh, when it's really really cold the bypass turned out that it's, that it's not always working and then you blow up the oil filter uh, the, re the, the how to solve it is simple you drill a hole on the inside and you, it cannot build up pressure anymore uh, even if the oil doesn't go all the way to the oil, oil filter all the time it doesn't matter as long as it every now and then goes through the oil filter it is good so um, but that's where tests are for, and even on my next bike, where I do things different, because the, 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 the bike was overheating continuously on, in Alaska, which sounds strange. But uh, I'm gonna, I gonna solve that problem too. But when I start in Alaska, I will not do this trip in one go. I will do this in, in two winters. First I will ride from Anchorage up to the most northern point in Canada, uh, over the polar ice of course, and leave the bike well, stop there and fly out from there, might probably take the bike with me. And problems that uh, occur or things that can do, be done better, I, I change, of course, in the, in the oncoming year. It's a very nice question what you ask me. Uh, a lot of people ask me that questions, and the answer is, I never had that point. I never questioned myself, what am I doing here? I never did because I know what I'm doing there. I, I, I know I like adventure. Um, when I was in the Congo, I was in the Civil War area. And uh, I wrote an article about that in my book. And the article is called Paradise in Hell. Because it was a hell to go through there. I was the first person who crossed the Congo in four years at that time. Before me, it were four vehicle trucks who crossed it. So it wasn't even a bike. And I called it paradise in hell because it, it was a hell, but for me it was paradise because that's what I like, adventure. People can see about my uh, trip from the past and from the future, my future uh, North Pole trip on my website. And I have already uh, explained on my website how I'm going to build the bike, how I'm going to do it, what the modifications are of the bike, all that is, uh, is already on my website. And there's also a support, uh, support page. Um, I did the same, on, same similar thing on 2013 during the Polar Ice Ride. Uh, that was, at that stage it was a sticker on my sledge, but now I'm going to take a flag with me. And people can have the name, the logo on the flag. Already from 10 euros on, they can be on the flag and ride symbolically with me. And they get a picture of uh, the flag every time that something special occurs. When I get the bike or even here at the U UK uh, uh, Horizon Unlimited meeting, take a picture and uh, people are symbolically with me then by having the name on the flag.